session and our first talk this session is by Lisa Ritour from uh, UC Santa Cruz and she's going to tell us about her work on um, probabilistic uh, soft logic. Um, so thanks, and thanks very much for inviting me here. Um, I very much enjoy coming to these kinds of interdisciplinary workshops where you have people from different communities um, uh, speaking. Um, and so I knew that I was talking after lunch, so uh, I want to start with some kind of Keep high level. Awake. Say again? Keep us awake. <laughs> I'll do my best, and you'll help me out otherwise, right? <laughs> um, so. The, rather than starting with probability and logic, though I definitely will get to probability and logic, I want to start at the other end from the kind of data that I'm interested in looking at, and in particular that's so abundant these days, where you have very rich multi-relational, multimodal, uh, spatial-temporal, all kinds of crazy data, whether you think of it from you know, social media or something like that, or think of it from IoT, smart cities, and so on. And on the one hand, I want to be able to build principled inference algorithms for making predictions from these. And I want to do that in a way that exploits the information as intelligently as possible. But at the same time, I want to uh, raise caution and uh, have a fair bit of skepticism about some of the kinds of predictive models that are currently being built from this data, because this data is so you know, crazy biases, noise, and so on, that um, I also want to give us tools so that we can question the predictions coming out of these kinds of models. Um, so putting on my uh, machine learning hat, uh, here's my abstraction of this kind of data. So I start off with this nice relationally structured data, lots of different uh, kinds of entities and so on. And what I would say most current uh, predictive analytics and machine algorithms do is they take this data and they flatten it and they put it in a table. And they put it in a table where the uh, columns are attributes or features, the rows are instances, and then I'm going to make predictions on this. And there's a lot of issues with this. So um, first off, just keeping track of even how I got these values from this richly structured data is an important piece in and of itself, just the feature engineering involved. But one of the most important things is when you do this flattening, there's typically an independence assumption being made. And that independence assumption is that those rows are um, IID, so independent, identically distributed. And um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in this talk is how do we mix logic and keeping track of the nice structure with a parameterization of a probability distribution that potentially is richer than just a simple one. And I'll return to this later, but I think there's a fair amount of connections to the exchangeability that we were talking about um, before or yesterday a fair bit, and then I guess there's another talk tomorrow that's about exchangeability, and I think these are important ties um, that uh, we'll talk more about. Um, okay, so for my talk, I'm going to give a little bit of background about statistical relational learning and kind of a context for some of uh, the approaches that have been done. Um, because it's after lunch, I'm going to be doing uh, uh, language, uh, probabilistic soft logic. I'll start off by doing it by example. So I'll give you some examples of programs. But then the key result and the one that Dan was very keen for me to talk about here uh, is a, a very new result that we have that has a connection between work in the um, randomized algorithms community with work in the graphical models community and uh, with other interpretations for these 
that um, result in a very uh, fast optimization. And then, time permitting, I'll do a little bit of a wrap up that kind of hopefully makes some connections with some of the things that have been discussed so far. So, um, statistical relational learning. So, uh, this was mentioned um, in the introduction. Connections between this community built, came up in the AI community. And at that time, so the first workshop was in 2000. Um, you know, Stuart gave an invited talk there. Uh, the, there's been a number of workshops, dog show meetings, um, a birth uh, workshop as well. And there's a number of distinct approaches that have been developed here, but I want to uh, mention one before I d dive into, or mention a couple of them before I dive into talking about um, PSL. And uh, one of the early ones who, uh, Avi Pfeffer, who will be here tomorrow, um, Daphne Kohler of Stewart mentioned this, probabilistic relational models. That was work, um, some of the work that I think is actually closest related to uh, some of the work in probabilistic databases. And I actually think that there's still a very nice opportunity for some um, cross-fertilization between those. And I will mention that a little bit more at the end. Then there's a collection of approaches that are kind of more generative. So like a blog that Stuart was talking about and then the probabilistic programming approaches like church and so on that we'll hear a lot more about tomorrow um, were also developed. So Brian Milch was doing the work in um, blog and uh, several others and then some of the later work was around Markov logic network. So uh, the Markov logic network work um, has already been mentioned uh, several times. And what I'm going to present now is something where syntactically it looks very similar to Markov logic. Um, but then I'm going to get into the very interesting differences in terms of uh, interpretations and especially scalability. And so if you're interested in like all this historic, these different approaches, this is a tutorial that covers a bunch of them. Um, but on to PSL. So PSL is a probabilistic programming language for defining certain kinds of collective inference problems, which I'm going to give examples of in a minute, where I'm trying to find joint distributions over a collection of unknowns given um, some evidence. And usually that evidence is going to be this kind of rich uh, uh, multi-relational social uh, networky kind of data. And like you know, many, many approaches. And I'm going to use logic for representing uh, relationships and properties using predicates. Um, I'm going to have rules, and I'll say more precisely what these are, but that capture dependencies or constraints, so they can be hard constraints. Um, Oftentimes, in these kinds of domains, you want to talk about aggregates. So you want to talk about the sets of neighbors of a node and so on. Um, and so having that kind of in fundamental in the language is actually useful. But the key difference from this um, language and most others is the random variables are going to be continuous valued. So rather than being Boolean, binary, 0, 1. They're going to be, be a range from 0 to 1. And then, like many things, a PSL program is going to be a collection of rules applied to an input database. And then that, as I'm going to show shortly, is going to define a probability distribution. Um, so let's do this by example. So one of the kinds of problems. Uh, that we often want to do is, you know, we have some network, we're trying to label the nodes. And, you know, timely um, inference 
now and we're trying to label them with their uh, political parties. And typically what happens in these kind of collective classification problems is you have some of the nodes where you have observed labels, um, but you have some other set where they're unobserved. And what I want to eventually do is get a joint distribution over all of these unknowns. And so how do I do this? Again, by cartoon. You know, first off, for a particular node that I'm trying to make this inference for, I want to use all the local information I can. So if I know something about the campaigns that they contribute to, well, that's a feature that should go into my model. So I should have something that says, well, if they donate to a particular party, they're more likely to vote for a particular party. And I am going to have weights associated with these. I'm not going to tell you yet what the semantics of these weights are, but I will show you um, how you can learn these weights from data, um, or you can learn them from data. Uh, other things, you yeah, have their status updates, their tweets. I can look at some you know, words that are used in them and say something, again, about some uh, local evidence that I think it's more likely they vote for a particular party. But now the interesting piece is, you know, I have this kind of network. So I want to not just use the local information. I want to use things like, well, if their friend voted for a particular party, they're more likely to vote for a party. If their spouse votes for a party, they're more likely. And maybe I have some sort of relative weightings that says this maybe is um, more informative. And then what I want to do is I want to um, label these nodes. So again, this is a template for the kinds of inferences that I want to be able to do. Um, Another common inference is predicting relationships. So this one's a little bit richer, uh, where you know, I have. What does the meaning? What's the meaning of the weight? So I am going to get to the meanings of the weights, and that's actually going to be uh, the important piece. So, so, so for now, my uh, problems that I'm going to do, the next two problems are just supposed to be motivation, what I want to be able to do. Um, so I have some communications. And based on the communications, I'm going to infer the kinds of emails people send. So maybe they send social emails, deadline emails, and so on. Uh, then I can say something about, well, if they send a certain kind of email, then that may be indicative of the kind of relationship that people have. Um, and then finally, I can have more definitional constraints. So if A is the supervisor of B and the supervisor of C, then the relationship between B and C is colleagues. And maybe I want to make that a hard constraint so I can um, give it an infinite weight. And then the last kind of template for the kinds of problems that I'm interested in, these were mentioned um, in earlier talks. Entity resolution is a very common thing that you want to do where you have some references, so A and B, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, are these this John Smith the same as this J Smith? Then I want to use something about the similarities of the names and say, OK, they're more likely to be co-referent according to some string similarities. I could use a whole bunch of string similarities here. Oftentimes, you want to do that. Um, I can look at the overlap in their friends. And so this is a nice one where you get this kind of uh, recursive dependence. You know, They're going to be similar if their friends are similar, or their friends are similar if their friends are similar, and so on. Um, and another place where you get that kind of um, dependence is this kind of transitive closure. If A and B are the same, then B and, and B and C are the same, then A and C are. And again, you might want to make this a hard constraint, but oftentimes in the kinds of entity resolution problems we work on, while you want to make it a high weight constraint, you don't actually want to um, enforce it. So 
back to the language and what it means. So we're going to take this collection of these weighted rules, and we want to make reasoning tractable by mapping them to a convex optimization. And the way that we do this mapping is interesting. And this result is actually very new, um, you know, just a year and a half ago or so. I think, you know, we've touched the tip of the iceberg. I think there's lots of things that can still be done from this. Um, and I'm going to show you three ways that we get from these kind of weighted logical rules to the same convex optimization. And that's the thing that's actually very attractive, that from these kind of three sets of assumptions and three different actual interpretations for what those um, continuous value or zero, one, between zero and one valued random variables mean, you get to the same thing. And then I'll show some results on real settings where um, it works. So um, I'm going to actually be flipping back and forth between a logical interpretation to the um, probabilistic interpretation. So bear with me. Right now, I'm going back to the logical interpretation where uh, this is the simplest possible setting, where I have weighted logical rules of the following form. Um, you know, maybe this isn't the prettiest notation, but uh, uh, I'm going to take these rules that are like what I had before, and then I'm just going to rewrite this in equivalent clausal form. Right? So CS101. Right, Demetrius? Um, and then I'm going to do what lots of people do. I'm going to define a probability distribution where the probability distribution is proportional to the exponent of the weighted sum over all of the rules of these clauses. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to be looking at the kind of inference I'm going to be looking at is map inference, where I want to find the assignment to the random variables x, then maximize the exponent, given a ground database. And so at this point, all of you should be thinking, OK, it's after lunch. Clearly, I'm missing something, because she just defined maxat. You know, we know this is combinatorial. This is MB hard. So nothing's happened here. Um, but now I'm going to switch the interpretation. So I'm going to go from the logical interpretation to an uh, alternate um, interpretation from um, uh, randomized algorithms. And I'm going to change the view of the variables instead to be rounding probabilities. So they're going to be the probability that I round up to 1 or down to 0. And so um, then what I can do is I can you know, rewrite this so that um, I'm looking at the expected score of a clause. And looking at that expectation um, and then putting it into the total ex expected score, I get the following. Yeah. And again, at this point, um, when saying, OK, well, you still haven't done much for me because this is still horrible. It's non-convex. You know, uh, this isn't an easier problem yet. Um, but at this point, I'm going to make use of a very, very old result, um, uh, which Dan may end up chatting about a little bit more later. Uh, but a, a basic result around um, having approximation guarantees um, uh, for this by doing some relatively straightforward uh, rewriting of the probabilities in terms of um, uh, the uh, 
in terms of the expectations and putting a linear bound on this. And the nice thing is that I've turned this into something where I now have this linear form. And then on top of it, I have a guarantee for it. And so we can get a 3 quarters optimal guarantee for the discrete solution using this. Okay, and again, this is a known result. The thing that's interesting is, you know, I've taken something that was combinatorial. I now have a convex problem for solving it, but I can make a connection between this and approaches that people have done in the graphical models community for doing approximations for large Markov random fields. And um, so actually, kind of remember this general form here. Uh, so within the um, graphical models community, a common approach, so common that people often just say, oh, it's a linear relaxation of the Markov random field, is to um, approximate doing the maximum a posteriori um, inference by taking the kind of complex um, probability distribution, the joint distribution, and basically relaxing it so that you only ab obey some of the constraints in the distribution. And um, there's, there's a big line of work in doing this, but you're basically trying to find consistent marginals in some sort of simpler set. And so let me, um, so luckily from uh, earlier talks, we've seen a bunch of factor graphs already, but the way of viewing the weighted uh, rules over the joint distribution of the x's, these phi's are the um, represent the rules, either the um, local potentials or um, binary potentials, or you can have higher order potentials. But the grounding out of the database with the rules defines a large mark of random field where the thing that's unusual about these potentials is they correspond to the logical functions. Now, from this, what we can look for is we can look for the marginal distributions. Now, normally, when you're doing exact map, you would need to find the marginal distributions that are consistent with you know, all of the constraints. But oftentimes, what one does is one just looks at the local information and then finds just the consistency there. And so it turns out that if you take and push, do some um, basic algebraic manipulation of uh, the uh, overall representation for this joint distribution, then you can actually end up getting this form for the local consistency relaxation. And this form for the consistency re relaxation is exactly the same form as what we had for the randomized map inference. And now, the cool thing, you know, forget whether or not you're interested in PSL or not, this connection between a bound that was well known in this community to this thing that people were doing in the graphical models community but didn't have any bounds for is um, a important contribution. So these are two of the interpretations. The third one um, is also you know, where we started. So when we started off doing uh, probabilistic soft logic, we were very interested in problems where we were doing these kind of matching problems where we wanted to like align ontologies and we wanted to say, you know, are these things the same? Is this relationship the same? And then, you know, think of the entity resolution problem. Then there's a bunch of 
instance data that you're trying to match as well. And we started off with having variables match, not match, so 0, 1. And we tried to do this using MLNs. And it just you know, to didn't work at all. And so we um, changed the interpretation so the, the random variables in this setting is, are actually the similarity between things, or um, alternatively, more generally, the degree of truth in these things. And when we did that, we were, this is the third interpretation, we were using uh, an interpretation for the rules. This is coming from soft logic. There's a bunch of different logics that people use for doing this. We specifically chose the Lukashevitz logic because this is the one that gives you a convex um, function. And so, uh, in particular, um, uh, keep an eye on this that um, when you convert this to a notion of distance to satisfaction, and again, there's some um, flips and mins and maxes going on here, but you get this inference objective, and at this point, hopefully this is starting to look familiar, um, this ends up being the um, same form as the other two. So we've shown this equivalence between these three different interpretations, and so this one formalism and um, a set of algorithms, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, um, in a sec, can um, deal scalably with these kinds of problems. Um, we put this into something that we generalize a bit further called a hinge loss mark of random field. Uh, the form you know, from before looks like this, but now we're going to turn this into a loss that as long as this is a linear function, will support it. Now, at this point, we're starting to lose some of the equivalences, so it's still actually an open problem to continue to show the equivalences once we generalize this this way. And then um, uh, the full form ends up being, it's a form of a conditional random field, so we have P of Y, and then normally we're conditioning on some X's that give us this nice form, okay? And this means that from a program and some data, we get this out. Now, the question is, one more thing about scaling. Uh, going to this form, so we can use an off-the-shelf optimizer, and we have used off-the-shelf optimizers. It turns out that instead of Solving it as one big optimization, you can actually make better use of the fine-grained parallelism. So I can do something where I optimize over each of these pieces. And for this, we used um, ADMM. This is a popular approach for convex optimization, popularized, repopularized by Boyd. Um, and it's guaranteed to converge. Now, there's other optimization tricks one could do beyond this, but uh, this uh, works well. Part of the reason it works well is because there's this optimization function has, uh, that we're proposing has a lot of fine-grained structure in it. And the fine-grained structure ends up having these simple pieces where most of them are actually trivially solved. So um, this ends up being nice. So in theory, we've gone from, um, this is a cartoon, uh, combinatorial to something that we can use an interior point method to something that we can use ADMM for. Um, here's some results. I'll have some more later on a real problem where you know, we have hundreds of thousands of potential functions. This is something where ADM, uh, the interior point method takes hours, and this is taking seconds or a minute. So, 
Um, okay. But does it work on real problems? Uh, briefly, compared with discrete MRFs, so discrete MRFs like MLNs, for a collective classification problem and a link prediction problem, you know, I want this is accuracy, this is area under the precision recall curve. The big thing is, you know, we're slightly better in terms of accuracy, but, you know, orders of magnitude better in terms of speed. These are for small problems. Uh, for another flavor problem where we're trying to do image completion, you know, we can compare to things like um, deep belief networks and so on. Um, we're um, doing a little bit better than the kind of state of the art, and we're also doing it fast. Yeah? What is the intuition that the, 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 the quality is better than the original one? Because in certain lens, PSL is an approximation of the discrete ones, which should be almost as good, but it seems to be even better. What is the intuition for being better, not just faster? Well, so you had the slide. Your closing slide was exactly this, this kind of trade-off between uh, accuracy of the model and inference and so on. There's a lot more to be teased out here, but um, we have found that uh, oftentimes we are doing uh, a better at the problem. And so that may mean that the MLN representation wasn't capturing the problem that well. There, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, uh, and another kind of problem, activity recognition in video. Um, again, these are kind of state-of-the-art computer vision um, features that are often used. And then what we did with the PSL model is we put a relatively trivial model on top of it that had something that essentially says, you know, if there's a bunch of people doing something in a video, they're probably doing the same thing. And if they were doing something in one frame of the video, they're probably doing the same thing in the next frame, unless you have strong evidence to the contrary. And we get a significant bump up in performance over the baselines. Um, and then a different kind of uh, problem uh, on computational um, biology of drug target uh, prediction. And this is a case where, again, we're beating state of the art. And um, we have done a lot of different applications in a lot of different domains. Normally, in a more applications-oriented talk, I would go into these more. I think some of the ones that are kind of interesting are within the computational social science space, we can actually kind of encode different competing social science theories for how people trust each other and then have a data-driven way of comparing them. Um, the application that I'll mention a, a little bit more, just uh, given the time, um, some of the results, partly because I think it highlights a place where there's a mix of using probabilistic inference together with logical inference is knowledge graph construction. And uh, this is basically an information extraction kind of setting where I can use either just source statistics or I can add in some information about entity resolution or I can add in some ontological constraints, where the ontological constraints are the things like subsumption relationships, domain range, and so on. Now, normally, those are intractable to do inference with, but we were able to um, encode this in these PSL models. And both of these contribute to doing a better job at inferring the knowledge. And we can do it fast. So compared to the competing MLN talking to the implementers, they said, you know, it took a day or more to run. And we're running this in like an hour. You parallelize it. We're running it in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, over you know, millions of ext extractions. So 
popping up and doing a little bit of discussion. So I have like five minutes. Um, so I'm really excited about PSL. Hopefully that came across. I'm happy to talk about it more. But in the context of this workshop, I think there's these interesting opportunities for connecting work in theory, databases, probabilistic databases, and the machine learning community. And I think that there's some interesting differences in motivation. But at the same time, I, I find it fascinating that there's actually some core pieces that are similar. And I'm going to speak to it more the place that I know the best, the relationship between the SRL and the probabilistic database work. But um, some of the places that I see opportunities are exactly around lifted inference. And so lifted inference, I think we've seen in the talks, uh, you know, Dan's talk, this, both Dan's talks this morning, and then uh, this afternoon, Guy and also Wolfgang um, talked about lifted inference from a probabilistic database perspective. I think there's also some techniques from the graphical models community about lifted inference that haven't fully been exploited. So I, I think there's real opportunities there for um, more work. And one of the places where I see this is there's a real difference in the kinds of queries that I, as a when I'm putting my machine learning hat on, want to do. I usually want to do map inferences or marginal inferences versus in probabilistic databases, they do these cool inferences that are over richer kinds of queries. So even like a select project join kind of query where you are um, uh, doing a lot more potentially inference to solve that. But there's this difference in how things are parameterized. And so the parameterization of some of the SRL methods are much more at the schema level and rather than at the data level. And that piece, I think, can be exploited. And you know, one piece of work where we connected to PRMs for doing this is the following. And we actually did, you know, connecting to yesterday's, some of yesterday's talks, use a form of by simulation to um, be able to answer the lifted inference question. But I think there's, there's really rich things to um, be studied here. Structure learning, learning the structure of these rules is um, important. And I think it connects to exchangeability. Um, open world semantics that Stuart mentioned. Uh, this is a place where I see the, the models that I talked about today were mainly discriminative. They're not generative. There's an interesting kind of opportunity to mix these, I think. And I'm happy to go into this in more detail. And then um, none of this talks about causality, interpretability, explainability, all of these are hugely important for you to have confidence in what's coming out. And that is part that goes to what I mentioned at the very beginning, kind of exploiting, being intelligent about how one can exploit the structure in the data, but then also having some skepticism about what's coming out of these predictive models. So um, I want to say thank you. And then I want to do my uh, advertisement for Santa Cruz. So uh, we have my colleagues here. We have our redwoods, our nice building, our view. And then just down here, we have uh, <laughs> so So come visit us. Um, I'm going to pictures of Houston. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned Gomez Williamson, Money yeah. Collection. This is the semi-definite programming, right? Mm -hmm. No? There's two papers that year. Hmm? There's two papers that year. <laughs> There's two seminal results, and they're actually the same year. Um, yeah. 
So, so it's not that paper. Actually, a lot of people. Yeah. Oh, because SDP is beautiful theory, but I don't think it works well in practice. What? Yeah, the, and this is a different paper. <laughs> Dimitris and I have had this discussion. <laughs> Yeah. So you are approximating and then you are you know, relaxing it into a complex problem. Uh, do you say well, so in a weird way, so one interpretation is a relaxation. And then if you go with our original one, which is our soft interpretation, that's an exact result. But sorry. Anyway. No, so yeah. I was going to ask is if you, you know, if you don't do the relaxation, maybe some non-convex techniques can give better results. Or, uh, um, that's interesting because um, one of the things that uh, I don't know that this is exactly this, but I didn't get to talk about learning the weights and we also allow latent variables. As soon as you put in latent variables, then it ends up being non-convex and we actually have some cool work for dealing with that case, uh, but it doesn't have uh, quite the same punchline. Okay, so it's uh, time for speaking.